Thanks for coming again. Thanks for being in the grand ballroom. Uh, with this channel, I would have expected people to dress up a bit more nicely, but we're geeks. So I guess that didn't work out. So today I was asked to give an uh, um, inspiring speech about things and stuff. And I think that's a very good start for a day. I wanted to give something very, very technical, but then it's a keynote, so you don't do that. So don't expect that from me. But we can talk technical in any way you want to. So I want to talk about how the web used to be this massive disruptor to a terrible market and how it changed over the years. And how in the last few years, especially last year here, a lot of people started scaring us into thinking the web is not there anymore and it's a new thing that we have to do right now and we're all going to lose our job and be homeless in like two months because we don't support the newest, coolest iPad. So it's like this children's book that you can buy there, which is called You Can't Be an Astronaut, It's Just Not Realistic. This is really cool to give to your kids. Like, <laughs> There you go. So. Back in the days when I started on the web, it was like this. We had wired connections and we all had keyboards to surf on and we all had to keep the mouse up, otherwise we would fall off the keyboard. And this is what the web was about. It was just beautiful and in nice colors and every kid had the thing sideways. It was just this wonderfully cool thing. But in reality, it was a really cool thing. I worked as a radio journalist back then and I saw the internet is there for everybody to start publishing and for everybody to be found worldwide and to communicate with people worldwide. And to me, this was a totally new thing. You know, before that, we had these like BBSs where you had to know the telephone number to call to connect and get data from another server worldwide. And then with the internet, we connected then with modems that sounded a bit like Skrillex, but really wasn't. And it's just <laughs> connectivity. And you, you stood there and like, this almost looks like an image. Just give it another five minutes and it'll be fine. And you had like connections where you loaded something and then you disconnected because you paid per minute. And then you went through the cache to find all the images that you've been downloading because while you were loading, it was too slow. All these really cool things. But it was a geek thing. And uh, the main market basically saw us like that. They saw it like this Ubuntu launch party there. That basically these are the geek guys that, that, that just do that and it's never going to catch on and nobody cares. And uh, old school programmers, like mainframe programmers or like people that use Java and things like that, people who have beards and suspenders and are real men, <laughs> told us that the web will never be anything. That's just a toy. Like pff, you use that angle bracket stuff that's never coding. Nowadays, it's a bit different. You know, the web is mainstream, and we're all these cool hipsters. <laughs> and we, the, everybody uses the web for something. Most of the time, horrible things, but like, you know, like following Justin Bieber on Twitter and things like that. But everybody uses it. And we're seen as these like, magical creatures that can build websites, and we, everybody, nobody knows what we're doing. And the reason why that blossomed so much in those few years is that it's built on a principle that anybody can be on the web just with an HTTP connection and something that shows HTML. Doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter what your ability is, what your language is, what your connectivity is, everybody is invited. That was the Olympic Games, the opening, and that's when Tim Berners-Lee typed this in and said like, that the web that he invented, or with other people, uh, is for everyone. And we keep forgetting that. Just how powerful the web is for people who don't have a voice in mainstream media, who, who, don't, who cannot get a school education, but they can go to an internet cafe and look at a Udacity course or look at a Khan Academy course if they wanted to. They can look at Wikipedia. I mean, like, I went to the, I went to the library to do my homework. I didn't have Wikipedia. And I know teachers that actually put wrong things in Wikipedia articles to see how many students will actually bring that in their, in their essays, which is a really cool way of using the web as well. So everybody on the web is a consumer and a creator. And we keep forgetting that, because we're getting into that, that consumption thing. And people get like, excited, oh, oh, I can watch Game of Thrones streaming on my internet. And you're like, how is that better than TV? It's just you can start and stop it. That's like a VCR. And a streaming video, a streaming TV channel would allow, me to, allow the audience to remix it and to do things with it, and to, to, to vote on different endings and make them different. And this is what we do in Mozilla with the Webmaker Project, where we invite kids and journalists and, and, uh, and people who are just afraid of computers and not use the web for anything to start playing with it and start creating. And seeing how empowered they feel when they start creating is just gorgeous. Because for a lot of people, it's a totally new job that they couldn't have had before. So good times were had. We had these browsers that got better and better and better. We had a few browsers that finally died. 
and we had a few browsers that actually agreed on everything. HTML5 means first and foremost that all browsers render HTML the same way. And that was a big, big thing. We see this as, an, as a given now, but actually that white space in Internet Explorer between LI items means you couldn't style them. That was just a very, very annoying thing. And you had to delete like all kinds of things in there. And the browsers got better and better, and we're like, yes, we got it made. We got these cool HTML5 uh, APIs. We can do something. And then change happened. I mean, what's the main difference between Bill Clinton's inauguration and Obama's inauguration, except for the size of the flag and the color of the president, is everybody has this phone and takes pictures. Really blurry ones, really bad ones, but everybody wants to take a picture and put it up online and be like the first one to put it online, because the 600 other people in that room don't do the same thing. They don't have the same idea. I love it that when you're at concerts and people hold their iPads up and film the band, and you're like, yeah, that sound quality is going to be amazing. I had it the other day at Dropkick Murphy's, and I'm like, dude, last time you wouldn't have survived and your iPod wouldn't have. But when, fair enough. So the web came around, and the mobile phones came around. The smartphone came around. And all hail the hypnophone. Everybody has one. Everybody needs one. It's a great thing. You can talk to your friends who are on the other side of the planet, so you don't have to talk to people next to you because they're smelly and like they, they, they spit and stuff. You, you have your virtual friends, so you don't need to do actually real connections with other people. But you can complain online that you don't have any friends. So <laughs> it's a very on-the-go market. And sometimes you even have connectivity, even with, your, even with your at and It started well. This is Steve Jobs, the visionary, the really, really good man, really, really interesting guy. And he, he released the, phone, the, the iPhone while well, he had a few people helping him. But he released a smartphone and iPhone, and the first thing he said, to be really disruptive and reinvent the phone, we have to actually have no SDK. It's the web. It's a web-based phone. You have Safari, you have the power of Safari and HTML5 in your hand. You can build everything on the web with the phone. You can build great applications that can talk to the telephone, can talk to, say, uh, to the map application. That's what he said. And then the big backlash came from developers and internally. And why did that happen? Well, first of all, the mobile web was this mixed thing that nobody knew what's going on there. We had this thing in the middle, and we had web developers on one side and native developers on the other, and both of them wanted to do it. And a native app developer is different to a web developer on, in many, many ways. They're actually used to a different environment. As a web developer, I've got no SDK. I use VI, I use Sublime Text, I use that, and we argue for a month who's got the better text editor. And we don't wait for actually downloading an SDK for it as well. So the mobile space is a competitive and very close market. <laughs> the success of companies is very much based on how many patents they have and what they can actually protect from another. Like, oh, you can't touch the screen of my phone because that's my right. And developers coming from that environment, for them, the web seems like scary. Like, oh, wait, everything is free, and I have to, you can look at my code? How can I protect my JavaScript code is a question I get every single time. Put it on memory stick, leave it in your desk. <laughs> Fragmentation is the next big horror. Oh my god, people have different phones and basically different sizes, and like, I have to support all of them. If only we had one government-issued phone for everybody that has a fixed <laughs> static thing. And uh, for web developers, I was like, yeah, so this is cool. I can write things for different platforms. But fragmentation is being this horror word for everybody. So shouldn't we cherish flexibility much more? Shouldn't we say, like, hey, if everybody cannot afford the newest iPhone, they have an old one, why not give them something for an iPhone 4? I mean, these are just people with so much hardship in their life. They only have an iPhone 4. So we should give them something. And if you think about it, these tablets and, uh, and smartphones are actually very flexible. Because you see, as soon as you tilt them, they get longer. Because nothing on an angle could be as high as the other one as, lo as, as long as it's longer. So every display of those, I guess if you have the phone and you hold it, it just automatically happens slowly so you don't realize it. But so tilting the phone makes it longer. And this is something to care about in your designs as well. So 
I wondered what the whole backlash was about. Why do developers get so riled up about not having an SDK and actually bringing the web on the phone? And I did some research and I found this wonderful website called The Story of Stuff, which explains about consumption and how uh, America with 1% of the world population creates 20% of the waste and all these kind of interesting things. So it's a great thing to learn on the web. It's in Flash, but it's not evil, so it's really nice. And I learned about an old, old idea from Victor Liebo in the Journal of, Reading 19, uh, Journal of Retailing, 1955. And actually what they said, and he was one of the advisors of uh, President Eisenhower back then as well, to make American companies be successful and make sure that we have money and jobs for the next few years, our enormously productive economy demands that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals that we seek our spiritual satisfaction, our ego satisfaction in consumption. We need things consumed, burned up, replaced, and discarded at an ever-accelerating rate. And that was in 1955. It's called the principle of obsolescence. And I'm happy I managed to pronounce that word. Now, as evil minds think alike, there's this person that a year before even took that further. So the, the built-in obsolescence means that products are built to break after a year or two, so you buy a new one. And you realize that with every brand out there. I remember when I could kick a car door and there wasn't a dent except my foot. Nowadays, you have to replace everything and the 15 sensors in there that actually realize you, hey, parking sensors and all kinds of things. So Clifford Brooks Stevens uh, uh, actually took that further. And you can see that he's a very content and happy person. Because <laughs> he came up with the idea of the planned and built-in obsolescence. So you don't even need to make things break. You just have to make them look old and look outdated. So you have to instill in the buyer the desire to own something a little newer, a little better, a little sooner than is necessary. And every advertising is about this. Everything we see on tally is like, this now has rounded corners. I'm like, OK. How many people really say like, oh, I was at Mobile World Conference, and they showed all these hardware providers went there. And I went to every stand like, what do you have? We got a new phone. What does it do? It's bigger. OK. Um, is it faster too? Oh yeah, 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 it's faster too. What else does it do? It's bigger and nicer. And like, it's just no change. It's just like it got something in there that actually has to happen. So perceived obsolescence is the next way of doing that. So planned style obsolescence occurs when marketers change the styling of products so consu consumers will purchase products more frequently. The style changes are designed to make the owners of the old model feel out of date. You feel embarrassed putting a first generation iPhone out in a coffee shop in San Francisco. And this is because of this. We've been trained to think that things have to be outdated quickly and we got to get new, 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 new. These shoes are 12 years old. Um, Doc Martens in England. Now Doc Martens has been sold to a company somewhere in the east. Doc Martens break within a year now as well. These ones don't yet. So I will be very unhappy when they, when they break. But it's just amazing how we got into that. And other people saw that already as well. This was the 50s and everybody got like, oh my god, we got to do this. And then in the 60s, some cynical mind basically said, the systematic attempt of business to make us wasteful, debt-ridden, permanently discontented individuals. And to a degree, that's right. People really, really rack up their credit card bills to get a new smartphone that they don't need because they actually have a good smartphone already. But they want to be the new cool ones to have the swag and be like awesome about it. So in essence, this is not our struggle. This is Apple's and Google's struggle and Samsung's struggle and hardware makers' struggle. We cannot compete with that. We cannot go and say, like, look, websites, you can edit it. You can change it. You can change the interface of a website. It will be maintainable for five years in the future. No, 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 no. This thing has to break tomorrow. What can you give me that makes people buy a new phone because they want to have the next version of that game? And this happens. So web development and native development cannot be compared one to one. We always do these like HTML5 showcases where we show that HTML5 could be like native apps. And then we make it work across all the browsers and across all the platforms like we should in HTML5. And it turns out not to be as performant and as good as the native app. If you really want to prove it that it's the same, do it on one platform, one browser, and one configuration. But this is not HTML5. This is just making a native app in some environment that should not be native. So fragmentation. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> fragmentation to us is a given. I never knew what browser you use, hopefully Firefox, otherwise you have a bad time. Um, 
I didn't know what connection you have. I don't know what resolution you have. I don't know if you're drunk. I don't know if you can read English. I don't know if you're sober, but you can't read English. I don't know anything about you. And I love that. I love to write defensive code that actually says, can you do this? Yeah, okay, do this. Add supports was put in Firefox nightly yesterday. Uh, so basically you can have modernizer in CSS itself and in JavaScript, and that's the kind of stuff we need. All of these things should get something. They should not get the same. They should get something that people can stomach. So to me, it's this golden playground. It's a bit like Temple Run. You know, you got this street full of gold, and there's all kinds of stumbling blocks and stuff. And we actually have to fix these stumbling blocks. It's a bit like the 101. Like, you go down to Silicon Valley, you see how many millions of dollars are spent on different companies, and you got all these potholes at the same time. So the mobile web is there for us to make a good living with and to make a, a great living with. But we just try to go for that big gold gem in the sky all the time. We want to be that $30 million, 17-year-old kid that got bought by some company because this is the future. And this is the same, I don't want to say a strong word, this is the same uh, uh, lie that we have with this built-in obsolescence. Like, yes, there will be one guy who's actually starting to Facebook. There will be one guy who gets one billion for his company. But this is not maintainable. Not all of you can be that guy. And not all of you probably want to be that guy because they don't have a free time in their life anymore and a lot of pressure on them. It's like, who here plays um, an instrument? Oh, swings in the band. Why? You can never be as good and as successful and fast and rich as Justin Bieber. You don't need to play your instrument. You need a producer. You need a, a, a nice dance move. You need some swag, and that's about it. Why do you bother with this? You, you cannot be Justin Bieber. He's much younger than you, he's much faster than you, he's much better than you. Why do you do it? Because you like it. It's fun to do. A musician is a person that takes thousands of dollars of gear 100 miles away to play a $100 gig. <laughs> because we love it, because we want to do things, and we don't want that mainstream mediocrity that means that like, if you do the Justin Bieber thing and you're successful for half a year, you're going to be in rehab two years later. So let's play the long game a bit and think about what we're going to do in 10 years with that rather than like, oh, money, 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 more, more, bigger, bigger, bigger. So we need lateral thinking. So which line of this one is longer? The upper, downer, are they the same? No, they're not. <laughs> so why did all of you think that this is the same length? Because you've seen that thing before. It's an old trick. It's an old trap. And it's a clever trap. It's like, it's obvious that they should be different lengths, but it actually isn't. So you like, hey, I've seen that. You're not going to get me again with this. <laughs> and this is how we build things right now. We learn hacks in browsers, and then we just internalize them and say, like, oh, the web will always be shit at that. So I cannot do that in the future. I will just do it like this for the next 15 years, and the web just can't do it. I'm sorry. And let's think about it. Let's measure things. Not, don't get too excited about measuring. Like, there's lots of people who get like JS perf and these kind of things, which uh, it's just like you can measure things, but you have to measure them in context. But don't fall into the too clever trap. Don't see the thing for the first time and you remember it it didn't work last time and say it's not going to learn again. So what do we do now instead of, uh, instead of thinking about where we're going to take the web? We build many, 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 many awesome solutions. We build so many awesome solutions, it's, it's incredible. We've got these like Bootstrap. You don't need to learn any HTML. Just use Bootstrap and start from that. If you're not, you're not professional. Grunt, Ember, Backbone, jQuery, Sancha, HammerJS, Emmet, Compass, SAS, Les, Septo, blah, 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 blah. All these cool things that are coming out, all of these things are great. They really are good. They're tools for power users that need to actually uh, make their day-to-day -day job easier. And they're, perf they're great. And we just make new ones every month. That's the problem with it. But we actually just want to be more professional about it. So we tell people, these are the things you have to use. Otherwise, you're not really, you're not really a web developer. When I hear people say, you need to know the command line to be a web developer, I'm like, no, sorry. This is not the thing. The command line is not on the web. It's like you build things that are visual. You build interfaces. You build things that people need. We've got many, many, many awesome demos. Like this was going around a few months ago, a few weeks ago. The, the very, very rememberable URL, fff.cmismcm.com, which showed all kind of like plays and HTML5 canvas demos and stuff. All of the things we've done in Flash four years ago. And we now use an HTML5 and we say like, this is awesome. I think what we're having right now is an overflow of awesome. 
I'm getting tired of seeing awesome, 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 awesome. What I want to see is like, we have this really terrible content management system. We have a room booking system. Here's how we fixed it with HTML. Here's how we made people happy across five different platforms. We don't have to impress each other. We have to impress the mainstream. So stop building tools for each other and making the, the other tool do one thing less than the other one does. They're all open source. Fork them, do things with them. Don't build your own again. So I get excited about people building things. I've just been at PostCon in South Carolina, and all the developers you meet there are actually in small companies or freelancers, and you show them something. I did a CSS3 talk, and two weeks later you get an email like, whoa, thanks for your talk. Here's how I implemented it in my product. And I'm like, yes. That's, this is exactly what I want to do. Please build these things. Give it out to the main market. Don't be excited that everybody is clever on stage and then be depressed that you're not on stage and you build your own system so you get on stage. That's a bit of a loop we do at the moment. So the other day I had a guy in my gym in London uh, ask me like, hey, you've got a computer, so you know about the internet. And I'm like, that's obviously an interesting fallacy. But so. <laughs> He's like, oh, I want to get a new job. I want to learn about the internet stuff. And people say it's really good to be a web developer, and it's a really good job to know that. So I, I found this old piece, this old laptop in my, in my house that I cleaned up. And I just put, put uh, Ubuntu on it and a text editor and an HTML5 book. And that's what I gave him. I didn't tell him, use Grunt, use Ember, start with Bootstrap. That's how I learned it. That's how I got incredibly excited, realizing that if I put a different color in there, it looks different. Wow. And we can do that nowadays. The web needs no massive tools for production, for power users. Tools are great. For starters, don't overload them with things that they can't rely on in the future. All of these things are not built in the browser. So they will actually might, they might get outdated, they might get replaced. So don't teach people things that are just for the next two months. So how do we disrupt? How do we change that whole market? How do we get back to that idea that from the very beginning we said like software is on the web and content is on the web and it's distributed worldwide without having to send floppy disks and CDs to each other? How do we go back to that? Well, the first thing is to stop being scared. I mean, last year we had a few interesting things on stage here where people said like, well, maybe the web is, is not there. Maybe the web is going away. We gotta keep the lights going. We gotta keep the lights going. I mean, who of you as a web developer has problems paying the electricity bill? I didn't know it was that high in San Francisco. My brother's a fireman. He can't find a job at the moment or a better job. He hates his job. But yeah, when he doesn't do his job, people burn. When we don't do our jobs, things are five pixels off. <laughs> so don't be worried about the future of the web. The, the web survived Flash. The web survived Java. The web survived Java server faces. The web survived any kind of things out there because it's a distribution model. It's not technology. It's not a certain stack of technology. Will the web be the same in seven years? Hell no. It will not be the same next month. That's the power of the web. It keeps mutating. It keeps getting better. You cannot compare it with systems that are actually, this is version one of the web. This is version two of the web. No. This is worldwide changing constantly, every second, and that's the cool thing of it. So chill out, breathe. You're going to have a job in five years, 10 years time easily if you bet on the web right now. Will not be the same job. You have to be up on your feet and learn new things, but that's what makes it interesting. I always hated a job that I got a pamphlet and like, this is what you're going to do in the next 12 years. No change. Don't worry about it. OK. Mm -hmm. On the web, different story. New challenges every single day. So. I think we should stop copying. A lot of people like, uh, oh, there's a native app that everybody uses right now, so let's copy that in HTML5. Let's copy that in our technologies. No, it's a different idea. First of all, you got the obsolescence thing. Not every native app has everything in there in the beginning because they want to roll it out. If your app has all features at the beginning, you're not going to have a good time. You want to roll out month by month by month by month. So trying to keep up with that is not possible. So, Try to actually see the power of the web and the benefits of the web, of web technologies over native technologies. And the biggest one is flexibility. And if your app is not flexible, you're doing it wrong. The, the thing should actually tell the user, OK, this works, this works, this works. I have a problem with that, so I don't give you that functionality. Or just don't show the functionality. Don't promise things that you can't fulfill. And it's an if statement. It's not that hard to do. So if you copy, then kick ass. 
Sencha did this fast book and showed that the, uh, that the whole HTML5 is dead from Facebook was actually a misnomer and actually based on uh, wrong assumptions. So they did a good thing there and they show basically uh, that you can do a fast app on an iPhone in HTML5. Who should have known like, J like, uh, like the ex-CEO of the company wanted it to be? So that's great. If you do these kind of things, then we should also stop them from saying like, yeah, but it only works in iOS and it only works in that. Yeah, that's what we cared about in this moment. So we're fixing it together with them right now and Flexbox is now in Firefox, partly because Sencha Fastbook wanted to have it. And we actually had a real, real good reason and demo to actually show what the problem was. So the other way to disrupt is go where others don't go. And this is the, the problem as well. They were like, if you want to make money now, only go for the iPhone market in America. That's where people spend money. This, this Earth is this round blue thing, and there's these people, people everywhere. And they want to do things on the web as well. And why not tap into a market that is not there for others? Why not tap into a market where, uh, where the people that are actually driven by obsolescence cannot go because the market can't afford it, because the market can't do it? So. That is what we're doing with Firefox OS. Um, I'm not here to make a pitch. I just say what it is right now because it's 90% of my life at the moment and I get incredibly excited about it. And we went to the Mobile World Conference, which is the most evil sales show on this planet. I spent like two days just reporting uh, incidents of booth babes to like, uh, to, like uh, blogs in America that talk about uh, inequality at conferences. And we rocked that thing. We were in every headline. Like everybody released new phones, everybody released new things, and Firefox as an open source company, as a non-for-profit organization giving out a free operating system was the main headline. Why? Because we got 18 mobile partners to actually partner with us and four hardware partners to bring out phones that are internet connected, that are web connected with smartphone functionality to markets that cannot get iPhones and that cannot get Android phones and can't afford them. So emerging markets like South America, like Eastern Europe, we have a lot of partners that actually go out with them and these are not partners that sell the thing with us. These are partners that actually code the thing with us. So instead of just having salespeople around them, we're just like, okay, you want to be part of this? Show us your engineers. And this is what we're doing with that. So what Firefox OS does is replace old feature phones. We don't replace the Androids. We don't replace the iOSs because we cannot compete on that market. We don't have the marketing budget. We don't have actually the hardware. We don't have the people that want to actually partner with us because they're like, we're just stinky free open hippies. That's like not right to work with. So, the, one of the main differentiators for us here in Firefox OS is first of all that everything is HTML5 in that phone. Like nothing in here is, C, is Java or Cocoa or Visual Virtual C. This is all HTML5 and it's on GitHub. You can actually play with it. Of course, uh, for the mainstream market, this means uh, who cares? But what people care about is actually making it easier for them to find apps and to actually play with apps. And uh, what is easy finding things on the internet? Maybe a search functionality, maybe something like playing with it. So if you go in Firefox OS, and hopefully my connectivity working here, and I have a mouse somewhere, there you go. This is the emulator that you just put into, into Firefox as an, um, as an add-on. And once you put it in there and it starts, why does it do that to me when I'm going on stage? There you go. You can start the emulator. This is what it looks like. You've got your error console. You can play with it. And this is the operating system itself. Now, if I go to a market right now and I want to know, an, I want to have an app. I want to have an app about my favorite band. I want to know something about a band. What do I do? I go to like, I click through like, OK, music apps. And then they got 6,000 of them, all of them reviewed by probably paid reviewers. And I don't know the name of those things. I don't know what to do. So that's why we have to pay posters. That's why we have to pay advertising to get our name of our app into people's heads. This is software. This is indexable software. Why do we need this? So in Firefox OS, if you go here, you search, for example, um, Nine Inch Nails. Let's do a good band. You get the background already changing to Nine Inch Nails. And you get, uh, oh, we have nine here. Wonderful. There's a space in there that was the problem. So let's use U2 as the normal demo. 
So U2, I've got my background here, a back change to the U2, and I've got YouTube for videos, I've got GrooveShock for music, I've got SoundCloud for music, Wikipedia for information, I can buy tickets on Songkick. It realized that I was entering a band and it gave me your applications, anybody's applications that are submitted in the market or are on the web. These are not the apps that are in my phone, these are apps on the web. So I can now click on this one, for example, GrooveShark, and start listening to, an, uh, uh, to uh, um, a U2 song, if I really don't like my life. <laughs> and once I had a good experience with that app, I can go back and actually do a long click on the app and install it. So a long click would then install it uh, on the operating system. And it will not operate it like a bookmark like it does on iOS. It actually will install it with app cache, with everything going offline and giving you access to the hardware in ways that iOS doesn't give you. So we made app discovery and app try before you buy as simple as actually surfing the web. So if you have a mobile website and you want to sell an app, your mobile website is your advertisement for the app because we can index that for you and you can actually show up in these search results. And this is bringing search technology to the, to the app world, which is quite interesting to me. And I think it's just for you a good idea to spruce up your mobile HTML versions that you have right now of your pages. So you can play with that yourself. And uh, somewhere I've got my presentation again. There you go. And I found that uh, uh, hard to explain to people at times, but once they started playing with it, they entered the movie title and then they realized, hey, there's movie apps, there's, there's Flickster, there's, I can watch these movies. So you go from the use case to the app and not from the app to the use case, which is what we do with closed markets right now. The other thing we do is we enable hardware access. So you've got all these APIs to actually access, to the, access the hardware directly from JavaScript. The Vibration API, which was called Vibrator API, and made too many stupid jokes. Um, geolocation was one of the first things we did years and years ago, and then it went out to all the browsers. So all of these APIs are not inside an SDK. These are standardized API proposals that other browsers can implement as well. So geolocation is across all browsers, the battery API is across all browsers, network information, speed connectivity APIs are being used by others as well, IndexedDB has been used by others. So you get full access to the hardware, and that was always the problem in the iPhone. You basically, you got promised to access the hardware, but you couldn't get to it. You just had to build a native app going through PhoneGap or something like that. The other thing we did is like, of course, we cannot allow any app to access every piece of the hardware because you could make a puzzle game that calls 1-900 numbers in the background and racks up lots and lots of money. So we actually have to review some apps in terms of security, where, how much access to the hardware you want. But we also came up with a system called Web Activities, which was much like uh, Web Intense in Chrome, but it's actually active. And uh, what it does, it actually tells, you to, tells the user to do something on your behalf. So if you want to do a telephone call, you have to have an app that's listed in the marketplace and reviewed by, by Firefox or by Mozilla. If you want to just do a telephone call from a web app that you host on your own server, you can do the most telephony um, PIC API here. So you got the PIC action. And the PIC action will, uh, no, OK, again, you need a photo. If you want to have a photo, you just call a PIC action. You don't care where the photo comes from. You don't want to know if it's from the gallery, if it's from the wallpapers, or if it's from the camera. So that's what you do. You do a pick action. The user then chooses which ones he wants to actually use. Give you a photo, you get the photo back. Same with a telephone call. A telephone call, you give the telephone action a, a, a call telephone number. It switches to the dialer app. The, the user has to initiate the call, so you don't do it on their behalf. It's up to them to actually make that call. Once they hang up, you go back to your app automatically, and you get the, the duration of the call and telephone number that was called. So the difference to the tell pseudo uh, uh, protocols and things that we had on iOS is that you get a feedback loop. You, you bring something to, the, to a native app, and then you get the data back. And that is cool, because I, I don't want to use your phone app all the time. I have a phone app that works fine on my phone. Why can't I just use that? So the web activities allow you actually to any website and any, any web app to actually tie into other native apps of the operating system. And that works across Android, and that works across Firefox OS as well. And I love that because I don't want to be in control for that. I don't want to have your, your Flickr or Twitter or whatever credentials. These are yours. Don't give me them. 
it's your, it's your way to share it on Twitter. It's, it's yours to actually take away. I don't want my app to be responsible for things happening on your Twitter stream. And that is right now happening because we identify on behalf of the user the whole time. So web activities allow any HTML5 app to go into native apps and do their, do their thing and get the data back. And that's much more important to me than actually accessing it myself and getting that information. It works well with others. So if you put Firefox uh, on your Android, all of these things, well, not all of the APIs, but the web activities, for example, work as well. So you can do that. And Firefox uh, for Android supports down to Froyo. So you don't need the newest, coolest Android to actually get HTML5 support, sensible HTML5 support. Chrome, uh, 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 Opera does the same thing now. So Opera is also a browser that you can install on Android to go back to an older, older version of Android rather than having Chrome only on the newest one. Another big thing that we just released is that you shouldn't make people think about the web, but just come halfway. At, uh, at the game conference that was just here in San Francisco, we announced ASM.js, which is also, uh, there is a meetup at 6 o'clock in our office today. There's on Eventbrite, I think. And what that one is, it actually allows you to convert C++ games or C++ code into JavaScript code. So if you're a C++ company and you want to do something on the web, but you really don't want to re-educate all of your developers onto JavaScript, because C++ guys looking at JavaScript makes them come out in hives and stuff, you can use that. So one thing we announced is the Unreal 3D engine now running in JavaScript and Canvas and WebGL in the browser. So you don't need Flash to run 3D games. So Electronic Arts was one of our partners to actually bring out the 3D gaming onto the web and just convert their apps, convert their games, not write them from scratch, because that's not going to happen. So we want to have the fidelity of 3D gaming on the web, but we don't want, to, want people to have to write from scratch, so we wrote a converter. Same with the PDF uh, displaying in the browser is also done through the same engine. So instead of having uh, a plugin that gets hacked every two months, we just ran the PDF in JavaScript, and the original thing was a C++ library. So if you've got cool C++ stuff right now, you can convert it to JavaScript rather than learning JavaScript, which to me is a, is a handshake back to the 1980s where it's like we can work together. We don't really need you to replace. The web will not replace you. We want your stuff. That's what we do. So what can you do? How can you be part of that? So the first thing is that I haven't seen yet, and I want to see much more, is context-aware applications. Everybody has like, OK, this is, an, uh, this is a responsive design. It's smaller on the phone and shows five buttons, and it's bigger on the other one. But it doesn't change the context. It doesn't give you a way to actually work with it. Imagine a company that actually has a guy walking around going to meetings. The, the interface on the phone could just be started there, find my location, stop the meeting there. When he goes back onto, into his office and he starts the desktop, he opens the same app, the same HTML app, and it actually shows him like, okay, here's what you did today. Please put the notes in there. Please put the photos in there. Upload the other stuff. We do different things that we do on, on a phone that we do on a desktop. And we shouldn't just make everything dumber because the, the mobile phone is the clever thing, but we just give you a context-aware app. What do you want to do on a desktop? What do you want to do on a mobile? What do you want to do on a tablet? Give you the best experience on all of these. And HTML5 is the only technology that allows you to do that because a native app cannot do this. You have to install three different apps on three different platforms, and that's just not clever to me. That just doesn't make any sense, that, that I have Temple Run on my tablet and my, P, uh, and my mobile phone, and they're out of sync, and I have to do the same challenges on both of them. That's just terrible. First of all, problem, but it's just not nice. Go small. Go offline. If you can cut out a few Ks, cut out a few Ks. If you can uh, make the thing work offline, that people can enter things while they're actually, uh, while they're actually waiting for it to load, great. That's what we want. We want this experience to be as smooth as possible because we're impatient when we're on the phone. We don't really care about reloading a page three times on our desktop, but on the phone it's like, this is broken, this is broken. I love it with maps when people are like, we can't find the map. Well, it's going to space for you. <laughs> be a bit more grateful. But yeah, when I'm here, one pound 50 per megabyte internet roaming. So if you have this 220 meg animated GIF uh, 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 landing page, I hate you. Fix the first generation mobile web. This was the, uh, the login system at the airport in Barcelona, how it looked on my Android. Well, that's fun. And especially as when you go through the second step, it asks you for your passport number to get 15 minutes of internet access. So I'm like, ah, sure, yeah. <laughs> Found somebody else's passport, so it's all good. 
But that should not happen anymore. This is just silly. You know, this is just a viewport meta tag should be enough to fix that kind of crap. And make it sure, make sure that you realize it. We've got wonderful things like VW and VH now in CSS as well, where you can make typography resize according to the size of the screen. So we can make the flexibility that Flash had years ago in web technologies easily nowadays. Trust and help the platforms. You want to, you're complaining that something doesn't work in Firefox? Go to Baxilla, complain. Be annoying, put screenshots there. Put, put like test cases there. Tell people what is wrong. Don't go on Twitter and say like, oh, Firefox does this wrong. I hope somebody from Firefox reads this and does my work for you. Same with Chrome, same with Opera, same with Internet Explorer. All of these things are available to you to complain where people are working on them. Not where we, where we get like applause from other people when we complain about them. Help us make the web better by using what browsers put in. I talked to you about ad supports. Look at that tonight. Don't animate anything in JavaScript. We cannot hardware accelerate your JavaScript animations. We can hardware accelerate anything in CSS because that's our engine. But when you simulate what the browser does natively, we cannot help you make the web faster. And then it's no, uh, then it's no help complaining that browsers are slow. You made that. You took over the browser's job. So you make it fast. If you let us do what we need to do, use translate instead of top and left. Use CSS animations, use CSS transitions instead of CSS animate in uh, uh, JavaScript animate. And we can make the thing better. And every six weeks, there's a new browser out. And these things change constantly. So please use that stuff and give us feedback what is necessary, what is unnecessary, what you like, what you don't like. So jump right in. It's fun. Yeah, it's messy. But hey, this is fun. So nothing stops you from actually helping the web of the future by helping the people who build the platform for the web. You can be massively successful tomorrow with a great native app. Good luck. Have fun with it. And in half a year's time, it's going to be obsolete because the next one has to come. If you want to go that, fair enough. If you, don't, if you want to play on the web, play by its wonderful open rules and be successful by sharing and by actually playing with things that come in there. Every week I find something new in browsers and it gets me terribly excited. It's a sad life, but it's just what if I had some of the things that I had in the past that I didn't uh, in the past, I would be on a beach now or something because I wouldn't have to work anymore. Every browser is a developer platform. Every browser is a conversion tool. Reader mode in browsers allows you to actually fix a lot of sites and actually read them nicely rather than having to click through 2,000 ads. So with that, I'm out of time. So I thank you very much. Thank you.